My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. Hello and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no-holds-barred truth about being a woman post-40. Created and hosted by me, writer and broadcaster, Sam Baker. Today's guest is one of the most stylish women I know. Now, fashion director for Times, I first met Anna Murphy when we were both regular stalwarts of the second row biannual ready-to-wear fashion shows. She was then editor of the Telegraph magazine, Stella, and I was editor of Red. Both magazines deemed not quite fashion enough by the fashion industry. I certainly dress not to be seen, and I think it would be quite fair to say the same of her, but oh how things change. Somewhere between 41 and 51, Anna went from anonymously chic editor to colourful fashion industry Doyen, with cascading grey curls and a wardrobe that manages to be both outre, there's a fashion word for you, and wearable. You go quietly into middle age if you want to, but she's not having any of it. I'm going to do a bit of a name drop here. I was talking to Carolina Herrera, the fabulously chic designer of a certain age once and she said to me oh you know there's one thing every woman needs in their wardrobe so I immediately thought oh great you know what is it is it you know a little black dress is it a perfect pair of jeans uh no it's a full-length mirror Anna joined me in a brief pause between parish shows to talk about her take no prisoners approach to aging how going grey was the most visible thing she's ever done and how she learned to dress to match She also shared her philosophy of why not try it, her one word trick to sorting your midlife personal style and why she wouldn't have surgery if you paid her. What I really want to talk about is how you got from sitting in the second row with me about 10, what was it, about 10 years ago? 12 years ago, maybe. Like very chic and stylish, but probably dressing not to be noticed. Would that be fair? Not dressing to be as noticed, maybe, (laughs) but I think, yes, in tandem with ageing, I suppose, we're always ageing, aren't we, but becoming aware of ageing and in tandem with that sense of invisibility that people talk about, I thought, well, what can I do to, to remain or if anything, become more visible? And I suppose one of the tools in my kit as a fashion journalist has been through what I wear, although it is it is only one of the tools in, in my kit. And in fact, the kind of the most interesting, the where this whole thinking about ageing started for me really was when I went fairly obviously grey. And um, I was warned by so many people not to do it. Again, I heard that okay. word invisible. Huh. Oh, just don't do it, you'll be invisible. And um, actually, it's proved to be one of the most visible things that I've done. So I suppose that got me thinking about these kind of contradictions, these things we're told that maybe don't actually add up to being how things actually are. So was the going grey, I'm trying to remember, was it about a decade ago you started going grey? It probably was about that, yes. So so I'm 51 now, so I was probably in my early 40s. And I'd sort of accidentally, in a way, slid into dying it. I mean, I think that's what happens with a lot of these things. It's not like you necessarily make conscious choices and started to have a little bit of a low light here, as they call it. And then suddenly (laughs) I was ending up all head of dark hair. And by the end, it was, you know, it's a pretty mammoth job of maintenance. It was sort of every two or three weeks. And I just kind of felt I was losing myself, really. And I just kind of actually got a bit cross about the fact that I was having to spend all this money and spend all this time Mm. dyeing my hair. So I kind of went for it. And um, yeah, that was kind of the beginning of me actually thinking, well, maybe some of these preconceptions around what we're supposed to do and not supposed to do and how we're supposed to be and not supposed to be as we get older are complete bunkum. Yeah, that's a very polite way of putting it. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's obviously the expense, but it is the time, isn't it? Because I remember when I thought, oh, I don't care, I'm going to go grey. And then I got cold feet and I remember saying to the guy who used to do my hair, not very often, but he did do it, I think I might start dyeing it. And he just like literally burst out laughing and he went, you can barely sit in this chair for two hours once every three months. Like, have you got any idea the commitment of dyeing your hair will be? I was just too lazy, basically. But you... Did you dye it grey or did you go grey gradually? I know I should know that because I probably knew you all the way through it, but... 
I grew it out, which in retrospect, I wish I'd just chopped it all off because I actually do know one woman who did that. One minute she had long, dark hair and the next minute she had a grey kind of pixie crop. And I probably looked terrible with the pixie crop. But if there's one thing I've learned, it's, you know, why not try it? Uh, so I slightly regret eking it out slowly over whatever it was, a, a year and a half. I mean, I obviously went shorter than it was now, but I definitely had the grow out. And at the time I, I thought, oh, it looks fine. And of course, now I look, look at pictures of me when I was grown out, it looked terrible. But you just get on with it, don't you? But another, just an interesting aside on that is that when I went grey, I was in a relationship and my partner was very supportive of me going grey. And I remember thinking, I wonder if I'd have the balls to do this if I wasn't in a relationship. Mm. And then at some point afterwards, we split up. And so I thought, aha, test case. Now I'll get (laughs) to see. And, um, you know, interestingly, and again, to my surprise, I did sort of app stating, which is something else I write about in the book, because I think so many of us, when we're older, we find ourselves single, we find ourselves starting again in all sorts of different ways. So I wanted to kind of write about that and normalize that as well. But yeah, to my surprise, one of my sort of my ticks on the apps for people was my hair. And I think I'm sure it didn't appeal to lots of people. But I think, you know, the people it did appeal to were the people probably that I appeal to more generally, for whom it signaled, I am who I am, you know, gray hair and all. I'm not sort of shy of of my age or the colour my hair is or whatever. So on the apps, what age category did you say you wanted? I can't. I mean, it's sort of, it changed. I mean, I, you know, I think ideally one's looking for someone of, of a sort of suitable age, <laughs> but I definitely had some enjoyable, um, unsuitable dates along the way. And again, I think that's another thing I was surprised by the degree to which uh, as a sort of older woman, you are very appealing to younger men. They want to see what it's like to go out with, with an older woman. So, um, yeah, that was, that was quite pleasantly surprising. Yeah. Cause I've spoken to other people who've, who've said similar things things, which is that they actually had more dates with men in the 20 to 30 category than they had with men kind of in the category they would have thought was technically more appropriate. So kind of 35 through 50. I don't know, maybe it's because younger men think, oh, well, she might not be looking for commitment and she's probably not looking for babies. Whereas the slightly older blokes who are, you think actually might be a bit too old for you, who are only want to date 30 year olds, you're like, oh my God, head fuck. There's all sorts of madness going on. There's definitely there's definitely sort of Mrs. Robinson syndrome, probably among men who don't even know what the Mrs. Robinson syndrome yeah, is. Yeah. Yes, older men looking for, you know, preposterously young women. But actually one of the things I, you know, I wanted to kind of reassure people about is that you can find your way through the madness. There are some really lovely, normal, fun people there um, to be found. And, you know, touch wood, I seem to have found one. But also I, I wanted to sort of just say to women, it's completely fine to kind of be on your own for a a bit or forever mm. I think so programmed to look for someone else and or when we find someone else to even if we don't realize we're doing it slightly sort of subjugate our needs to someone else's needs and I would definitely say that one of the most valuable experiences of my life to date is to spend some time on my own as a fully fledged adult you know I think when I was younger in relationships I really didn't know where I ended and where they began and now I absolutely know where I end and where someone else begins and And of course, so obvious to say, but so hard to find your way to this place. You know, that is the healthiest place from which to have a relationship. And, you know, I I speak now as someone who's very happy in a relationship, but I can confidently say that were the relationship to end, which obviously I hope it doesn't, I would be happy on my own, you know, and that that's a wonderful feeling. When do you think you reached that kind of realisation? I think probably really quite recently. So... I was probably single for about three or four years in my mid to late 40s. And it was in that window, finally, that I thought I'm still open. I think it's so hard. So much in life is a balance, isn't it? And one of the hardest balances to maintain is to be happy, contented in your own life and in your own self, but to remain open to the possibility of love. And it's very easy to swing one way or the other. And I think, yeah, it's probably just in the last few years that I managed to get to that place. And of course, the irony is there's nothing more attractive than that place to other people. Mm. So it, you know, probably opens up some opportunities for you. How important do you think the 
removal of the biological imperative is, do you think, in kind of reaching that place where you're like, okay, this is what I want from a relationship and this is who I am in a relationship? I think it depends on the individual, doesn't it? I think, um, you know, I don't have children myself. I've always been quite ambivalent about having children. I was never against it, but I was never particularly for it. And at some point that in itself becomes a kind of decision. So it may be that I'm the worst person to ask in that I've never really been looking for someone to be the father of my children. But I suppose, you know, talking to friends and seeing other people's lives, I think it, if you do really want to have children, obviously that is a sort of spanner in the works, as it were. That sounds like a terrible way to put it. If you're not, you know, some people are lucky enough to meet the perfect man at the perfect time. Many people aren't. And if you want to have children, then you have to make some quite difficult decisions about that. So I think I was probably quite lucky that that wasn't a part of a big part of my story. Um, but, you know, still managed to make some mistakes along the way anyway. And this probably sounds very pollyanna but I do believe that things aren't mistakes and that actually past relationships, I don't regret any of my past relationships. They were great people and they were wonderful kind of learning experiences. And I do think as we get older, we are better placed to take the rough with the smooth and to learn from that rough and enjoy the smooth. So, yeah, no, regrets. Do you change jobs to your job at the Times? What would that have been about 2014? Is that? Yeah. Yeah, Seven, eight years ago. How important do you think that was in shaping your approach to midlife and ageing? I suppose what this job forced me to be is more kind of front of house. (laughs) And in many ways, my natural instinct is to be behind the scenes. And of course, you can't really be behind the scenes when you're quite literally fronting up a fashion desk on a newspaper. So I suppose, yeah, it forced me out into the open, maybe. Yeah. And I I guess I had to be my own voice. You know, in my old job, I'd kind of I'd have an idea and then I'd get someone else to do it. I'd, I'd commission someone else almost to be my proxy. And I suppose now, you know, I speak my truth kind of thing. You know, that's not entirely natural for me but it's good for me and it's been really rewarding actually because you just get such wonderful feedback from women and I think because I am maybe slightly different from many people in fashion you know obviously I love clothes (laughs) sorry to laugh but but yeah (laughs) but I see clothes it's just a part of clothes as a form of empowerment really I'm not so much interested in what trouser shapes in this season I'm interested in what dressing your best can do for you in the sort of almost a psychological import of clothes um and because that's really just allowed me to connect with people and and I think the loveliest thing I hear from Times readers is that I've you know I've helped them to kind of make themselves manifest that I've given them a newfound confidence and a sense of sort of joy and experimentation and really destination fabulous there's lots of fashion in the mix but it's about extrapolating that sense of adventure and delight across you know all aspects of someone's life you've given that to the readers and it would certainly be true that you are probably the only fashion editor newspaper fashion editor whoever makes me spend money so take that back (laughs) to your boss (laughs) much as I hate you (laughs) but uh, what I want to know is how did you get there yourself because Mm. you are so confident in your clothes choices and you're actually so good at wearing really full on outfits, but them not wearing you. How did you get there? (laughs) Just for the kind of benefit of anybody who's listening and thinking, well, this is all very well. But if I put red and pink on together, they look like shit. Or I feel that they're wearing me, so I take them off again. So how did you get from a person who wore a lot of navy, let's be honest, to a person who I don't think, when did you last wear navy? Mm, can't, I can't actually remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I've always loved colour and worn colour, but I only ever used to wear one thing. So if I wore a bright jacket, which tended to be the way I wore a colour, then everything else would be black or navy. And I suppose it was when I was writing my first book, How Not to Wear Black, I started to, well, think about my own statement, How Not to Wear Black, and played around a bit more. I mean, I think probably a big turning point is I was talking, I'm going to do a bit of a name drop here. I was talking to Carolina Herrera, the fabulously chic designer of a certain age once, and she said to me, oh, you know, there's one thing every woman needs in their wardrobe. So I immediately thought, oh, great, you know, what is it? Is it, you know, a little black dress? Is it a perfect pair of jeans? Uh, No, it's a full length mirror. And um, it's pretty embarrassing admission for a fashion journalist, but I didn't have one at the time. Mm -hmm. We tend to have ideas about ourselves, you know, in so many aspects of our lives, including what we wear and, you know, what does work and what doesn't work. And indeed, the whole grey hair or not grey hair thing, it's an idea, isn't it? Oh, grey hair's ageing, dying, it keeps you looking youthful. 
But actually, ideas are often just that, you know, they're, they're not actually necessarily really that helpful. And so if you get in front of your wardrobe and just get in front of the mirror with your wardrobe and just sort of play around a bit, you can sort of start to have fun. And I was actually chatting to um, this fantastic influencer, Ven's Wife Style on Instagram, she's called, she's 57, Renata mm. Jazdik. I was saying to her, so what would you say to that woman who's lost her way with her wardrobe? And she said, open it up, have a look inside, pick out the things that make you happy. For whatever reason, they might be black things, you you know, there might be navy things, they might be sparkly pink jumpers. Find the things that make you happy and then look at what you need, what other things out there make you happy to augment the things you've already got that make you happy. And I think, yeah, you can get a long, a long way just with that. And actually, interestingly, on the colour thing, when I was younger, bright lipstick was just one of my things. And then for whatever reason, at some point, I sort of stopped wearing it. And then when I went grey, I thought, OK, I need to get a bright lip going again. So I started wearing bright lipstick. And I remember people were really shocked. They were like, oh, you don't wear bright lipstick. Oh, you're wearing bright lipstick for about three weeks. And then I was the person who wore bright lipstick again. And I think we we get a little bit too concerned about changing things, both for ourselves, looking at ourselves in the mirror, and when it comes to other people. You know, people get used used to you sort of changing it up I think that there's a little bit of a maybe not so much with the lipstick but certainly with the hair there's a certain extent to which your decision somehow reflects on their decisions so I always yes. think of it as being not that I know anything about breastfeeding but I always think of it as being like that that debate always just is always just like pour, pouring oil on it everybody I know who's made a decision to go grey has had that same experience of you where people going you can't do that it'll be really aging that's bad you can't do it it's, it's a mistake people have really 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 strong opinions about what you do with your hair yeah no I think it's very true and I think you know as women we're all freighted with so much kind of judgment so many shoulds and shouldn'ts and that comes into play as you say when you make a decision about whatever you're doing to your hair or your face you know that really is about them not about you you have to sort of do you and I think it's interesting actually that you know so much of these things that we sort of think are coming from us they're actually these huge financial juggernauts behind them I mean Mm -hmm. hair dye only became safe in the 1950s and that's when it was suddenly mass marketed to everyone because there was sort of money to be made and and it was all about that kind of this act of empowerment you know getting rid of your greys was sort of empowering and also happened to make you know this industry kind of billions of pounds a year so yeah it's just interesting how sort of supposed empowerment is kind of often used in a way to keep us enthralled to to you know certain commercial interests I mean obviously I've got no problem with anyone dyeing their hair I used to dye my hair each to their own but uh yeah it's kind of worth worth examining all this stuff. And of course, these commercial interests in themselves have much, much deeper foundations. They come originally out of concerns that go right back into, you know, fairy tales and fables, mm. and, you know, wicked old ladies for young princesses. This stuff around aging is itself, you know, as old as the hills. Yeah, on that note, let's talk about anti-aging and the anti-aging industry. I know you've got a few opinions about that. I mean, it's so insidious, isn't it? The beauty industry, and we probably both have to put our hands up in our kind of enabling of that from our in our previous careers, has, you know, made literally billions of dollars, pounds, whatever, from making women feel bad about their neck. Once people started saying, actually, we hate the phrase anti-aging, and what do you mean anti-aging? Are you just basically anti us being alive? It seems to me that from outside, happily now, the beauty industry has started to go, OK, we'll take anti-aging off and we'll put like pro-aging, eh? or menopause on our products, which is actually no different. I know where you stand on it, but I'm going to ask you for the benefit of the audience. Well... I think we're so looking in the wrong direction on all of this. I mean, seriously, Sam, don't get me started. <laughs> no, I want to get I mean, you started. Go for it. I think, you know, stripping out all the kind of big stuff around this, even if we're just dealing with straightforward vanity, you know, if I look at the women in their 60s, 70s and 80s and beyond who look their best, they are not the women who are having loads of things done to their face. Yes, I'm sure they're using a fantastic face cream. I'm sure they're eating a great diet and all the rest of it. But this idea that you have to start doing invasive procedures, just almost as you would a trip to the dentist, is just wrong, quite frankly. And you don't end up with your best face. Your best face is your true you, is you living the best life you can, having as much fun as you can, having as much joy as you can. It's that shining out of your face. And, you know, you think of these wonderful examples. Think of someone like Georgia O'Keeffe, you know, who died in her 90s. And those wonderful pictures of her. Her face is covered in lines. She looks like a remarkable mm. woman because she's a remarkable woman. And I think the, you know, the beauty industry wants us to anatomize our faces. And we do. We look in 
the mirror and we think, oh gosh, I didn't used to have that line. But when I see my friends, I don't see their lines. I see whether or not their light switched on, whether they're in a happy place. So it really is not about the lines on your face. But of course, you being in a happy place doesn't make anyone any money. <laughs> Quite the reverse of that. What a really interesting aside. So there's this book that I really love that I cite in my book. It sounds rather esoteric. It's on Chinese face reading. In Chinese medicine, they use the face as, as a diagnostic tool to tell them what's going on with you. And, and we sort of do that a bit. You know, if we see a friend and they look hungover or look as if they've got flu, we kind of know that. And um, there's a really interesting example she gives in the book of Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, you know, former wife of the former president of the United States. And there's a picture of her when she's a young woman looking kind of a quiet, slightly dowdy young woman. And then there's a picture of her decades later when she's Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, wife of the president of the United States. And she looks totally transformed. She, she's got lines, but she looks so much more kind of attractive than she did when she was a young woman. And the book cites this as an example of, you know, what happens if you find your purpose, if you live your best life? It's that that's made manifest on your face. And, you know, suffice it to say, injecting a load of toxins in there is, um, you know, it's just beside the point, apart from anything else. I mean, there are so many different ways we could go from here, isn't there? What would you say to the people who might think, well, it's, it's my face, it's my choice if I want to have Botox, I'll have Botox. I mean, it absolutely is. And I have no judgment for people who do things to their faces. I totally understand why they do. You know, we're in a society which tells us that having a fa face without lines is better than a face with lines. So just with hair colour, each to their own. But it's absolutely not the right path for me. And again, to reiterate, I think even just from a vanity perspective, I'm going to end up, if I keep doing the work on myself, you know, traveling towards the best me, I'm going to look better at 70 without Botox than with it, but each to their own, obviously. I mean, I think it says a lot that I don't think I've ever, of anybody I've interviewed, and that's, you know, well into the hundreds of women in, in this age group now, I don't think anybody has ever said, yes, I would like to be 26 again. I mean, people say, yeah, I'd like to have my 26 year old body again, although I don't think I would want my 26 year old body, but nobody wants to be their 26 year old self again. So it's it's that kind of disconnect, isn't it, between liking who we are inside, but this kind of, I don't know, the societal, societal pressure to not look like who we are inside. Yeah, I mean, that that is a huge disconnect in itself, that I'm absolutely also not someone who wants to be 26 again. I was chatting to a group of friends who were in their early 30s, and one of them said, oh, you know, what age would you go back to if you could? And they immediately all started giving out ages, oh, 22, 20, 21, 23, and, and I didn't. And then one of them said, oh, what about you, Anna? And I said, well, I wouldn't want to go back mm. and they these sort of 30 31 32 year olds were so shocked by that and then of course they wanted to know why I, why I didn't want to go back and you know being young is really hard being a teenager and being in your 20s is really really hard and there's a lot coming at you and you're not that well equipped to deal with it and now I feel much better equipped to deal with what what comes at me uh, so I, I certainly wouldn't go back there and so again why would I erase my face to go back there not that to be frank having any of this stuff done makes you look like you're 27 anyway it makes you mm. look other for me it is a kind of existential issue as well as a straightforward question of vanity as yeah. I said yeah it's um it's really interesting isn't it because I know that um you and I feel the same way on this which is that I feel like more comfortable happy confident in myself at 56 than I ever did certainly before my early 50s which is not something I would have ever guessed at before I kind of entered my 50s and also I can't help thinking maybe something that people don't really want us to know mm. no I, th I think and, that, and that's such a common thing I hear and, and one of the things that makes me most happy that I hear when I say something akin to what you're saying is when women get in touch and say, oh, well, wait to your 60s and wait to your 70s. Mm. It's just a kind of missing narrative, actually. You know, we know who we are. We hopefully have found people in our lives who also know who we are and love us for who we are. We've just come a long way and it's to be celebrated. And actually, our culture very strangely doesn't do that. I mean, particularly strangely, given that if you're lucky, you're going to end up in your 50s and 60s too. You know, the unlucky ones, the ones who aren't. So why not celebrate the direction of travel? You touched on um, invisibility earlier when you were talking about your hair. At what point did you start to feel, if at all, that kind of 
much vaunted invisibility of the middle-aged woman? Um, I mean, I just haven't. I mean, I'm sure I'm invisible to some people and that's fine. Um, I don't have to be visible to everyone. And I think we talk about the sort of visibility of youth and it's quite, to use that word again, it's quite freighted that visibility because that visibility Mm. is essentially sexual. And there's a but there's also a limitation there that you have to fight against. You can use it to some extent if you're comfortable with it, but even if you use it, you're also sort of fighting against it. And so I personally have not been unhappy to divest myself of that and have found, yeah, a different sort of visibility, I suppose, and one that serves me much better. For me, being visible is about the first stop on the path to being heard. I'm not interested to just be visible in my own, you know, full stop. There's a purpose to it, which is to be heard and to be seen in the kind of the fullest sense of the word. And I think probably I get more of that now in the sort of fullest sense. You know, the sort of visibility of being 23 is gone. But I mean, thank goodness for that, quite frankly. Yeah, totally. Uh, And I think, you know, it is this funny thing. There's so many contradictions, well, in life in general, but certainly in this kind of arena. And this is why I do argue for the importance of fashion and, you know, a bit of beauty, whatever it is, looking your best. Because actually, you know, whether we like it or not, first impressions count. And actually, I think one of the interesting tools, you know, Know, going back to that idea of, well, how do you dress? How do you find your way to dress if you feel that you've kind of lost it? A really useful approach, I think, is to think of a word, a single word. What is the word that you want to conjure in someone's mind if they were to see you for the first time on the other side of a room, you know, at a party or whatever? And are your clothes conjuring up that word? In fact, so I'm going to interview you now. What would your word be? I knew you were going to ask me that. Well, I think of what my word would be. What's yours? So my word, which kind of talks to my earlier point is interesting i want someone to see me and think oh what's going on there then you know she's obviously got something to say for herself so in a way i want the way i look to be the start of the conversation of course it's not always the start of a conversation because that would be quite tiring your look is your calling card essentially and i think especially as you age to wear a few things that are quirky you know a quirky earring a quirky necklace a quirky pair of shoes it's a really good idea it's about busting those stereotypes basically I think I'm probably approaching it wrong because I'm immediately thinking about my wardrobe and what it says about me rather than what I would want it to say about me. And what it says about me is that I actually just want to dress like a bloke and wear the same thing every single day. I did actually ask my dad this question and it was interesting firstly how he just didn't understand it Mm. because I think alas we're all too used to this idea of audience and subject and object as women we've lived with it our Mm. whole lives so if we don't immediately have a word which is very common when I talk to women especially women who aren't quite sure of their their wardrobe we get the question my dad just didn't get the question at all and after much much pondering he eventually came up with the answer comfy (laughs) I was like no but you don't want people to look at you and think he just didn't get it no that's how he wants to feel yeah (laughs) oh bless him so (laughs) for people listening who are like okay I feel like my wardrobe hates me you know my body's changed a bit and I don't like my clothes they don't like me but I'm a bit skint and I feel like the fashion industry also hates me it's not interested in me where do I start apart from with the magic word where do you start in a practical sense I think the magic word's a good one I think we have to stop this whole I'm guilty as charged we have to start this whole I hate this thing I hate my this bit of my body I hate my wardrobe it sounds such, such a platitude to say it but we have to learn to love ourselves and actually that full-length mirror that I was talking about is not only a place for you to kind of start to play around a bit more with clothes but I would really advocate terrifying as it sounds (laughs) standing in front of it without any clothes on and not letting yourself start in on whatever we've all got those boring you know repeat tracks about our legs or our thighs yeah, or you know our bit there that I'm immediately grabbing yeah. around my middle pick out the things that you love appreciate your body for what it's doing for you and I do think to find some kind of physical enterprise endeavor that is in no way to do with how things look 
but to do with what you can do with your body is a, is a massive game changer. So exercise that focuses on functionality rather than form, I think it, it's just so huge at this stage in the game because it means that there's a forward direction of travel. You know, maybe your boobs are saggier than they were, but look at this thing you can do that you didn't used to be able to do. I think, you know, that's a huge place to start. The thing about clothes is we don't need very many of them. You know, we're told that we do because, again, that makes people lots of money. But one or two or three things, new things bought over a year or two that you really, really, really love that you can spice up your wardrobe and indeed your life with will get you a really long way. And I think it's that thing of, you know, we often we sort of spend money on best. Think about what you actually wear. You know, if you are a jumper person, and let's face it, in this country, most of us are, then buy an absolutely gorgeous jumper that you wear for how many months of the year. You only need sort of in every outfit, you only need one amazing thing, really, or just buy a fantastic pair of boots that make you happy. There are so many different places I want to go from the things you've just said. I want to go back to the comment you made about exercise. Was it yoga that got you to where you are in terms of that kind of able to look in the mirror and not go, oh, what's that bit there, which is what most of us do? I think um, that has been a huge thing for me. And I am, I was that sort of sniffy, totally unalternative kind of 20 something. If someone had told the 24 year old me I'd be a yoga bore at 51, she'd have been horrified and disbelieving. Yet here I am, a yoga bore at 51. <laughs> um, but that was a huge change for me. I sort of started my mid 30s. And yeah, prior to that, I had been fit, but it had been very much that gym fitness and always this idea of sort of changing your body in some way. Mm. And that just was not working for me. And also there was no narrative to it. I think it is this idea of a narrative progression that is key. A late yogi, Vanda Scaravelli, she was called, she started yoga in her 50s. And she died decades later, having written this famous book in yoga about about back bending, and she she was this little bendy Italian woman. Before she died, she could from standing, she could bend all the way back and touch the floor. And this is a woman who'd done no yoga for the first fifty odd years of her life, and she just went on this amazing journey. And I think there's this thing that, as I said, well, firstly, your body is changing in positive ways if you're working on it in a kind of progressive way, and secondly, you don't really notice the sort of negative changes so much if there is progression in terms of what you can and can't do. And you know, obviously, yoga has it's kind of nutty kind of body fascism side like ev like everything else almost but there's a, a much more sane version of it which is just let's work on what you can can do and what you can't do and actually I think those things you know I certainly thought when I started oh I'm not flexible so I shouldn't do yoga mm. well actually of course I see the people who aren't flexible who should do it um and I really noticed actually the, the sort of benefit of it during lockdown when you know we, we're all in this weird stasis where nothing changed for days and weeks and months on end and yet there's all this stuff to worry about and actually Actually, if you just show up every day and do something on the mat, something's changing. You know, quite often it's not changing very much and you're still rubbish at something. But there is, I keep using that expression, forward direction of travel, but there is a mm. shift. So I do, I would really urge anyone who hasn't found their physical mojo, wh whatever it is, you know, it may well not be yoga, find something that, um, that lights your fire. I mean, another great example, I'm sure you and many of your followers know about it is her handlers train with Joan on Instagram and she's this amazing woman in her 70s and she was completely out of shape she was heavily she was very overweight she was sort of pre-diabetic she was pre-everything she's been going on this journey for about four years now and her thing is weights she's totally transformed she looks to have lost sort of decades never mind you know whatever huge amount of weight it is it really is never too late and it really does change your life prior to that were you in that kind of body image negativity calorie count vortex that well speaking for a friend you know consumes subsumes so many of us to a greater or lesser degree I mean I don't think I was a terrible case of it but I I think you know find me a woman who hasn't to some extent been wrapped up in that because again there's this signaling in our society around what size we're supposed to mm. be what things are supposed to look like so yes I definitely was worried was thinking far too much about what I should be rather than what I am and you know would weigh myself and would go through periods of being very self-denying and then periods of eating too much chocolate because I was so fed up with not having any chocolate um I was definitely not actually listening to 
what my body wanted. And the same went for the gym. You know, I'd, I'd sort of cane it at the gym and have that kind of post-gym high. And then I'd feel completely terrible and depleted. And so, yeah, part of what yoga has helped me with is tuning into what I actually want. You know, and I do want chocolate, but I don't mm. want loads of it, loads of it. And then weirdly, I probably actually want some spinach. Um, want spinach. And, yeah, I do actually really like to move. I mean, again, I think I, I'd, I was normally pretty fit, but if I wasn't at the gym, I'd sort of, I didn't think I enjoyed exercise. But actually, you know, our bodies and, and by extension, our minds are so much happier if we move around. So I think to just kind of tune into all of that is, is really helpful. And again, we're not culturally led in this you know that we're told from whatever ridiculous early age it is that we sh- should be this size and we should be eating this and we shouldn't be eating that and we should be dieting and actually your body if you just tune into it your body knows what it wants and it's a little bit of something naughty and probably quite a lot more of something that's good for it um but we just we just are so lost when it comes to that because we've got all this signalling coming from everywhere else. I've really, really been trying really hard to avoid the word journey throughout the course of our conversation. <laughs> but I do think you've been on one. Um, where in the course of this, if at all, did menopause fit in? I'm perimenopausal at the moment. So I'm sort of going through stuff, but I haven't actually had the menopause yet. And I think there's some stuff going on, but it's sort of fairly mild experience for me so far, touch wood. I mean, I'm I'm, do, I'm getting pretty brutal migraines. It's unclear as to whether they're men or not, but it seems quite likely that they are. So I guess if they are menopause linked, then they're pretty brutal. But other than that, a fairly sort of light touch. So I don't feel, you know, I'm in the perfect position to sort of comment because I haven't kind of got to the end of the road. And I think it's so, it's such a different story for everyone really, mm. isn't it? Mm. But I would say, you know, there are some interesting perspectives going back to Chinese medicine. In Chinese medicine, menopause and also the equivalent for men, andropause, is seen as this great moment of liberation, this great kind of shift of gear from one form of creation of the most literal variety, which is having children, bringing up children, to all sorts of other creation, whatever it, you know, whatever you want it to be, taking up painting, going scuba diving, wearing stupid jumpers. And that interests me because I think menopause in our society has become sort of synonymous with kind of negative, you know, negativity. Mm. Oh dear, the menopause, now what? And we have to be really careful about always with everything about the sort of power of thought, don't we? And actually, if we look at menopause, you know, which whatever its challenges as a kind of opportunity, then I'm quite excited by that. And I'm prepared to have a few bumps in the road in order to, you know, to continue with the journey analogy in order to sort of come out the other side. That's the thing that I think about a lot and that has come up again and again is that sense of instead of celebrating it as the next stage if you like and if we treated it the same way as we treat puberty one person I was interviewing I can't remember who it was now was talking about giving their nieces period parties you know literally Mm. if we approached it in that way I think it would be completely different you know what's happening is I think that a lot of people are talking about menopause now but it's becoming a oh everybody's talking about it and instead of it just becoming in part of the conversation and part of the narrative it's become you know as things tend to a thing and then there will be a backlash to the thing because that's how everything works instead of just thinking about how do we reframe this part of our life in chinese medicine they talk about it as as taming the dragon and then the dragon's tamed you know quite literally you know some of us this sort of fiery bloody dragon (laughs) uh and, and then you know we can get on with other stuff. And I really like that analogy. And I think there is this thing, isn't there, which is it's tied up with how women are made to feel in society as they get older. And a doctor who I I cite in the book says, you know, he sees lots of women coming to him very anxious about menopause with menopausal symptoms. And a common theme with many of them is they've sort of lost their purpose. You know, their children Mm. left home or they dedicated decades of their lives to putting other people first. And they're having a massive identity crisis, understandably. And society is not showing them an alternative, you know, and actually there are alternatives there. And there is stuff about, you know, lovely tricks you can do to make your face age well. You know, there's obviously stuff about fashion, as I said, but there's quite a lot of, for want of a less pretentious word, sort of existential stuff about, you know, how to find your purpose again, how to find joy, how to just enjoy this incredible ride we're on, which is just sort of so interesting. And and, and one of the writers I quote, the late 
Elizabeth Jane Howard, you know, very, mm. very wise woman. And she talked about, she was really quite old at this point and she was quite um, unwell, but she was still talking about the, the idea of this art in ageing well, you know, mm. ageing Campbell and that is a sort of noble purpose and ageing is interesting. And, you know, that's not to say it's without its challenges, obviously, but I think if there's anyone who can take on those challenges, it's it's someone older. You know, we are, we are wiser and we can get wiser. And I suppose that for me, you're right, Sam, I think I have been on a journey and I'm a lot further down the road than I was 10 or 20 years ago. And I fully intend to be further down the road again in another 10 or 20 years time and be looking back and thinking, oh, what a fool my 51 year old self was. <laughs> you know, I go on that road still trucking. I was thinking the last time I spent a lot of time with you really was when we used to, you know, be sat together in the second row of Milan being slightly scathing usually. And the change in you in lots of ways, and that's, I mean, the change in both of us, obviously, but it's really interesting to kind of look back over that period and see quite a big transformation. And it's easy to see that transformation in you because you've changed a lot physically. I'm pretty envious of your like silken grey curls. And I need to know what product you're using to get those grey curls so silken. I am obsessed with this product range. It's called, it's absolutely brilliant. It's called Living Proof. And they have no nasties in them. Because one of the reasons I actually wanted to, to stop dyeing my hair is the toxins in hair dye, especially mm. in dark hair dye, is much worse than blonde hair dye, weirdly. So Living Proof have no nasties in them whatsoever, but they really deliver on performance, basically. And I think for many of us, as we go grey, frizz is a problem. And they have a whole range that's, they have a curly range, but they also have a whole range just to live, um, focused on frizz. And there's something I use called Intense Moisture Mask. And you leave it on, they say for five minutes, I leave it on for 15 minutes and then wash it off. And it has been a complete game changer. And the other thing I would recommend actually is to use a towel for even if you don't have curly hair, to use one of those towels for curly yeah. hair. It's basically like an old, like Bouclem does a good one. Yeah, I've got um, the Bouclem one. Yeah, you just don't want to kind of rough up the texture any more than it's kind of roughed up all, already. So they're my, my two top tips. But Living Proof is fantastic. It's not the cheapest, but it's brilliant. And actually on that, when I first went grey, every few weeks or months, my hair would start to go yellow. And I think it's because I was accidentally putting toxins in via mm. my hair products. Now there's no yellow in it at all. So sort of chlorine effect. I mean, I'll put the link to Bouclem and Living Proof in the show notes. Um, and I've been sitting here looking at your very smooth forehead. And I know you haven't had any tweakments because you couldn't possibly because you'd be outed. Yeah. <laughs> so what yeah. do you do? Because you must do something because I can't see even when you're like screwing up, it's not very wrinkly. I do have frown lines. And I'm not gonna lie I don't love them but it's interesting because uh, the lines are all there to tell you stuff you know the clue is in the name frown I've got frown lines because I frown and I actually have a friend Alexandra Sovrel who does absolutely beautiful face oils which I would highly recommend um and because face oils just whilst we're on the topic they're the only thing they've got molecules small enough to actually sink into the dermis so they actually feed the skin so big fan of face oils but Alex Sovrel had frown lines so she claims she's now in her early 50s she doesn't have a frown line at all and she just trained herself to stop frowning which I keep trying to do but I keep healing but the lines are all there to tell you stuff but what yeah the things I'm evangelical about face brushing so face brushing just as you, with dry body brushing it's the same thing basically gets rid of toxins so that's the first thing I do the second thing I do is face oil and both the face brushes and the face oil Alexandra Sovereil is the British brand that I recommend you put on a light bit of face oil just you know showing your face some love because again it's amazing how we buy all these expensive creams and we just sort of slap them on just actually to kind of put some, you know, just press some oil in. And then I take something called a gua sha, which is a Chinese beauty tool. They've been using it for millennia. And I recommend a British brand called the Hayu Method. It costs about 42 quid, best 42 quid you'll ever spend. And with that oil already on the face, I massage the face. I should have actually got a gua sha here to show you. Is it you. like a jade roller uh, thing? Yes, but it's much better than a roller because it's sort of shaped like a quite a large plectrum. So it's got all these kind of... Oh, I've seen those, cool yeah. means you can actually use it to kind of, you know, like hook here hook here and you basically massage the face using that i mean if you buy one how you do it is all on the kind of attached leaflet and what you're doing is you're bringing blood to the face and blood brings oxygen brings nutrients and gets rid of toxins and um, so you're making your face red so you know you don't want to go out for a martini immediately afterwards uh, but it fades in a few minutes and that is what is doing far more for your skin than you know any kind of 150 quid cream they try to flog you so those would be my top tips right yeah 
Yeah, because I've seen those plectromy things and I've kind of got looked at them online and thought I can't actually work out how you would use them. But you think they're better than the roller? I think definitely, yes. I've tried the roller. I mean, the, the roller is better than nothing, but you can really apply pressure with the gua sha. Even a chubby face like mine, it is a series of angles. So to actually be able to hook into them. And that there's actually two different shapes that I recommend. The Beauty Restorer, which is the plectrum. And there's something called a precision tool, which is almost like more pen shaped. And you can really use that to get into bits like this. And what you will feel when you start to do it is proper knots of tension in your face. You know, we all, I mean, it's unsurprising when you think about it, but we hold tension in our face as everywhere else. So again, just to release that tension is really going to kind of help your face kind of lift and smooth. So you can make really, really big changes to what your face looks like. And what I love about it is it's still your face. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not, um, yeah, I was chatting to uh, another a sort of 70 something influencer, Linda Rodan, the other day. Mm, She's amazing. I woman. love her. She's so cool. Um, great grey hair fantastic lipstick and very honest and she was saying she started to ha have a, a bit of tweakmenting done at about 10 years ago and she looked in the mirror and she, and she was just starting to lose the way she put it is I'm starting to lose myself so she immediately mm. stopped I just don't want to lose myself no I feel exactly the same way right I better ask you the questions I always ask what's your mm. emotional age well, I'm going to say my emotional age is exactly what I am, which is 51, because I think another of these kind of misnomers we've got is that, oh, young is fun. You know, 15 is a great emotional age. I have a lot of fun. I have, you know, I'm at least as silly as I was when I was young. And I do think that that's a really important part of aging well is, you know, never say goodbye to your inner child. So yeah, my emotional age is 51, but that's maybe not the 51 that someone might think. Give us a book recommendation. So it can be something that you've always loved or it can just be something you've read recently that you thought was great? Well, I have always been a big lover of fiction, um, which is why I'm going to surprise myself by giving you a non-fiction recommendation, mm. because actually it's one of the books that really led to my book. And it's incredibly famous. I'm sure you've read it. Many people would have read it who are listening to this. A Road Less Travelled by M. Scott Peck. He was a psychologist who worked in the States for many decades. And again, it's this idea of life as a journey and life as a process of map making. And what we most of us do is we spend our early years incredibly busy making maps. And then at some point, we just use the same old maps and we mm -hmm. stop making new ones. And the road less traveled is the road of always making new maps, always taking new turnings. And like many of the best books, it's a really short book. It's a really good book. I'm all for a short book, I have to say. And I haven't read it. I mean, I'm really aware of it, but I've never read it. So maybe I'll rectify that. What advice would you give younger women? Well, it probably sounds very naff, but to just to try ch and tune in to who you really are and what you really want and what really makes you happy. I know there's messaging coming at you from all sides, most of it not very helpful. But actually, if you can just tune into your inner voice on everything, it knows. Just try and hear it. That's the thing, isn't it? It's like listening to it and even if you get you get to a point where you think you are you can still quite often turn around and go uh, I wasn't listening yeah who is your old bird role model oh do they have to be alive no it can be anyone old. Well, I suppose probably in which case another psychologist, the late Dorothy Rowe, just endlessly wise, endlessly traveling, endlessly questioning, having a lot of fun along the way. I'd be very happy to follow the Dorothy Rowe model. Not sure where she stood on lipstick, but, you know, nobody's perfect. <laughs> you can't have it all. And when I started out in journalism on Chat Magazine, she was one of the agony aunts. Oh my goodness! Which is wow, did crazy. you meet her then? Yeah, but it just you just didn't realise what she was Dorothy Rowe then. But but also she was one of those women who looked very. She had that kind of traditional middle aged look, didn't she? And she looked like that then, and that was really long time ago. It's easy to forget what a recent phenomenon people like us are. We have choices in a way that women of earlier generations didn't, and it. It's not surprising, really, that the world hasn't caught, quite caught up with us yet. But um, that's all the more reason for us to travel even faster. Uh, what's your superpower? I think my superpower is getting upside down, which is something that I have been doing in yoga. But the reason it's my superpower is because I'm so naturally terrible at it. So I was someone who did yoga for over 10 years and couldn't even remotely do headstand. There were people coming to the room doing headstand. I could not get upside down. And sort of through sheer doggedness, headstand is now pretty easy for me. Now, I'm all, now it's all about handstand. And so my true superpower, I think, is 
bloody mindedness. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, you know, a life lesson, the ability to keep on trucking at something I'm really bad at which I hadn't really realized before, you know, it's easy to keep on trucking at something you're quite good at, but to keep on trying at something you're not, there's nothing more challenging, but also more sort of expanding than that, actually. And I think there's, you know, there's a metaphor for aging in that as well. I mean, I'm finding them everywhere, obviously. But Yeah. Um, last one, how many fucks do you give? Absolutely zero. What's less than zero? Less than zero fucks. There we are. Literally none. Minus none. Yeah. Minus none. None to the none. When do you reckon you got there? <laughs> oh, probably not that long ago. I think it's really hard. Uh, the conditioning is is deep, just probably in the last few years. And again, I think probably that time on my own was a big part of it. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I was um, reading an article earlier in the week by someone who was married, but saying, I don't really want to divorce my husband, but I do want to live on my own. Mm. And I do think that living on your own as, for a while as an adult existing as a single unit something in that isn't there yeah yeah I mean I do think you know if it weren't for kind of financial realities I think many people get to the point including very happily married people that uh you know in a dream world they'd stay married but they'd live you know on either side of a park or whatever I do kind of think that's the dream do you do that now no, unfortunately, I live on either side of a city. But yeah, yeah, I'm still carrying my knickers in a bag across town. So in that <laughs> sense, still 21. Maybe that's my most load. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks, Anna. It's been brilliant to see you. It's been too long. I'll hopefully see you in real life soon. Oh, well, lovely to see you. Um, yeah, thank lovely you so to much. See you. Take care, Ben. Thank you for listening. You can hear a new episode of The Shift each Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, please do rate, review and follow because it really does help other people find us. And if you'd like to support The Shift further, please consider becoming a member of our community. Find out more at steady.media forward slash The Shift.